I'm going to speak today on modernizing public warning messaging. I started studying how the public responds to disaster warnings 45 years ago, and I'm still doing it today. And I decided that the purpose of my talk would be if I had to address the men and women in our nation who will issue public alerts and warnings in the future, what would I tell them? And that's what I'm going to say today. I have five things to say. First, focus on alerts and warnings for imminent rapid onset events with a small amount of time between when an event is detected to impact. Just to give you an example, if they just detected searing gas in the Washington subway and you're on the escalator going down and you get a wireless emergency alert on the cell phone, focus on that message or other things comparable to it. If we're talking about warnings that in three days a tsunami is going to impact one of our cities, we don't need to prepare for warnings. People will figure it out. When public response time is short and warning delays have large public health and safety consequences, and where wireless emergency alerts, the technology of the future in our nation, can provide the largest public good. Two, remove delays from the warning system. Delays are anything that prolongs the time between when a threat is detected and public protective action is initiated. So just to be clear, when you detect a threat, it doesn't mean anybody's going to protect themselves. That comes way down a sequence of stuff you have to be a social psychologist to get excited about. Delay types. There are three major points of delay in warning systems in our country. The first is warning issuance delay. The amount of time those who would press the alert button delay pressing it for a variety of different reasons. And in imminent events, that's not a good thing. Second is audience dissemination delay. Many people think because if you issue a warning over whatever technology is available and being used, that it will be received by the people at risk. The data suggests it's not that straightforward. And third, public protective action initiation delay. Once people get the warning message, that means what delays them from stepping over the threshold of their home and getting in the station wagon, sorry, SUV, and peeling rubber out of town. Delays are additive, and this diagram illustrates that a hazard notification is received, then we have issuance delay, a warning is issued, and then we have dissemination delay, a first warning is received, and then we have protective action delay. And if you were on the escalator, getting your first alert about searing gas at the bottom, uh, you could see there's a problem here if the delays are too long. Planning can reduce issuance delay. Let me say that again. Emergency planning works. Not planning doesn't work quite as well. Gee, who told me that? Oh, it was FEMA. No, was it President Eisenhower, I think, said that, <laughs> actually. Uh, warning plans and procedures is the essence of planning. With threat conditions, warning triggers, public protective actions cataloged. Here's an example. This is a planning matrix for dams and levees. Why is it for dams and levees? I was asked to prepare one for the Army Corps of Engineers, so I did it for dams and levees. But it pretty much looks like the emergency planning matrix for emergency planning at our nation's operating nuclear power plants because it's virtually identical to it. And anyone who knows New Rego 654, Rev 1, that's going way back in time, uh, will recognize this. There are uh, physical observations that lead to different classifications of different threat levels that lead to different levels, in this case flood threat, that lead to different possible public protective actions. 
Planning suggests this can be thought through before an event happens. And I'm sad to say, our nation doesn't participate or require or even uh, help local emergency managers plan for giving warnings, unless it's in the emergency planning zone for a nuclear power plant. And I'm out to change that. Planning also includes primary factors like having written plans, rules and procedures, threat classes, secondary factors like identifying responsibilities for who has the decision uh, responsibility to make a decision, who they need to get approval from, uh, tertiary factors like threat verification procedures, interagency contact ad nauseum. And four, my fourth thing I wanna say is disseminate alert and warning messages wisely. Every dissemination channel for disseminating warnings has pros and cons. They include factors about the audience who would receive the message that either help them get it or keep them from receiving it, technological factors about the ability of different technologies to reach the audience. For example, there's a matrix I don't expect you to see. Just trust me that some of us in the country have gone through every warning dissemination mechanism we have at our disposal and have judged it in terms of the percentage of our at-risk audience it can reach, whether it's a quick dissemination or a slow dissemination. For example, wireless emergency alerts are very quick. Root net notification where cops drive up and down the street with the blue lights doing this with a bull speaker is slow notification, very effective, but slow. Uh, etc. At any rate, that potpourri exists in different levels in different cities and counties in our country. And selecting a good mix of both old-fashioned technologies and wise technologies is probably very good. Uh, we're just beginning to collect data. In fact, I own it. I just finished a survey with a colleague, John Sorensen, of evacuation at the Oroville Dam in February of, this, of 2017, and we measured these things up one side and down the other. And I can tell you in that one event, what was the most effective dissemination technology, how long each different technology took to reach different segments of the audience, what percentage of the population evacuated, what percentage didn't. Uh, I haven't shared the data with the core yet, so I'll just give you a tidbit of a sneak preview. Wireless and modern emergency warning technology is fast. Mama is faster. What that means is the quickest way people got their first alert was because their mother or a friend or a relative got in touch with them. Well, that's not really a surprise. Your mother has more interest in you than other uh, devices. Here's some wire diffusion data from the Boulder flood. That's how the WIA message uh, reached the population in that flood a few years ago. As you can see, it got up to uh, about 18% of the population and eventually peaked at about 30%. And the initial speed with which it got out uh, was very, very rapid. We are just beginning to collect uh, data on wireless emergency alerts. Here's historical diffusion data. What that should suggest to you is somebody took a statistically representative sample of people who received warnings in a particular American disaster event and asked, what was your first alert? What time did you get it? And then plotted uh, graphs. The different disasters that are on this slide are there. There are very diffusion rates. In this slide, you can see informal notification, which is under the red line, which is the cumulative sum. The blue line is at the top. That's mama. Diversity reduces diffusion delay. If there were one thing I wish I could tattoo inside your foreheads, it's this. Multiple dissemination channels for public disaster warnings yield quicker and more comprehensive audience penetration. There never has been, there never will be, a silver bullet for distributing warnings. One technology is insufficient because you need multiple technologies to reach different subpopulations in an at-risk audience. So I'd recommend 
doing two or three modern technologies and two or three old-fashioned technologies. Uh, we as SMS tested methods like radio, route notifications, special ways to reach unique subpopulations, and if you're into wireless emergency alerts, particularly iPods is we a system, and I'm a Y-Pause and we a system zealot. I know that's the warning system of the future in this country. I'm 100% behind it and I wanna make it as good as it possibly can be. It has to be one flower in a bouquet of dissemination channels that are used. And it has its advantages as well as disadvantages. And five, issue messages that reduced public action delay. Now here's the social psychology part. I'm grinning because now I'm feeling like I'm back at the University of Colorado in a lecture hall. This is the problem you're up against when it comes to giving warnings. It's human beings. The myth is people immediately take protective actions when they receive a warning message. Here's my response to that. A social psychologist that studied this phenomenon for 45 years. If you believe that, you're nuts. Let me say it in real simple language. When all the forest animals are running away from the flames, people who get the warning delay taking protective action and instead waste time searching the net, watching television, and talking with neighbors, trying to decide what, if anything, to do about the fire. It's called milling. It's fundamental to how human beings invent new realities in their minds. And go, a warning tells people they need to go from perceiving that they're safe to perceiving that they might die. That doesn't happen quickly. It's not automatic. People need to, let me just say it in a way you'll get, schmooze before they come to that change of mind. And we see data, for example, in the Joplin tornado, where people got a five-minute warning of an impending tornado and were found dead in rubble with their hands on their cell phones as they were milling, trying to interact with other people. And if they didn't have a cell phone and they were in their backyard, they'd be talking over the backyard fence. Milling is basic human nature. It's basic human nature to search for more information, confirm warnings with others, check out what others are doing, and personalize threat perceptions. It takes time. Human beings don't respond to warnings. When people get warnings, what they do, their natural hard wires say, let's go hang out with other people and talk about it. Now, the prime objectives, therefore, in an American warning system of the future, the one I'm hoping to bring forth, is to minimize issuing alerts and warning messages in America that motivate milling and delay. And instead, to maximize issuing alert and warning messages that reduce delay and are actionable, that is, motivate public protective action. Two things I need to say. The second is the slide. The first thing is the Department of Homeland Security funded a lot of social psychologists and sociologists and communication people to study warnings a few years ago. And there were many breakthroughs learned. And one of the things that was learned that that 90 character we a messages accomplish nothing. What people do is get that message and say, what the blank was that? However, a message that provides them with the information that they would go in search of can actually minimize delay and maximize an appropriate, more timely response. Hallelujah, we discovered what we need to put in a warning to communicate to the person at risk to motivate them to take a protective action. I think that's the essence of what a warning system should do. And uh, the FCC believed us and they said, we're gonna take the 90 character limit off WIA messages, and we're gonna give you 360 characters for a WIA message, because that's the size of a screen. Let me tell you what such a message would look like. For your information, here's first, here's some historical data. These are curves about people getting the warning and initiating a protective action. The axis is when they got the warning. 
Do you see any straight lines going up? That would suggest people don't immediately respond to warnings. If you look at how they bend and lazily move over across time to initiate a protective action, there it is, I'm rubbing your nose in it. I mean to be rubbing your nose in it. People don't immediately respond to disaster warnings. We know, by the way, all the correlates that dozens of people have discovered, the relative weight of the correlates of uh, what affects uh, public response to warnings. I could send you these, and they're like chocolate chip cookies I could serve on a plate. But what impacts protective action initiation behavior in Americans the most? It's the message contents. It's the message contents. It's the message contents. Any questions about what the most important factor is? It's the message contents. It's what the message says and how it says it. And there also are contextual factors like whether there are personalization visualizations. They're really hard to issue warnings for a flood on a sunny day, for example. And it's about message repetition. People need to get warnings many times because human beings, even me, have thick skulls. Any of you encounter anybody like that? You know what I'm talking about. So what does the message need to be? It needs to be specific. For example, if you are in between the river and First Street, move north of Main Street. That tells people who's at risk. If you don't tell them who's at risk and who isn't, people prefer believing they're not at risk. Never say evacuate if you're near the river. That'll mean different things to different people. Some will leave, some won't. Uh, you need to be clear. A wave of water 20 feet high moving faster than a person can run is clear to the person being warned. Not a 10,000 cubic foot per second flow moving at a 20 foot per second speed. People don't know what that means. Fluvial geomorphologists do. <laughs> Dam operators do. They love these words. It communicates not out of the public. Uh, here are the things that need to be in a warning message based on the new DHS research. Source, hazard, location, personalization, consequences, protective action, protective action time, how action reduce, uh, procedures, uh, re reduces consequences, and the expiration time. What is he nuts? He wants to cram all that in a warning? Yes, here's the warning. 349 characters will fit in the next generation we a message. Elm County Sheriff. The source needs to come first. People want to know who they're listening to. What do we do in the country now? We put the source last. The source has to come first. Elm County Sheriff, floodwaters are approaching Wood City and will hit two blocks on both sides of Elm Creek from Highway 1 at 10 to Maple Road. People outside will be washed downstream. The water will be above rooftops, move two blocks plus from the creek now and be there no later than 6 p.m. to avoid the flood. This message expires at 11 p.m. May 15th, 2017. 349 characters inside of our 360 character we are long message. Granted, I picked a simple one. I didn't want to make it rough on me. So what conclusion? Can we encourage comprehensive local planning for alerts and warnings in the thousands of communities uh, where alert originators reside and practice their craft. We have a really big country with lots of diversity in our emergency response people. And can we upgrade practices by alert and warning messages, message providers? Can we educate them? Can we design a course for them to give them this information? Can we give guidance to them? Can we write a guidebook for them? Can we encourage them to engage in training, drills, and exercises? Well, Shazam, that all sounds like it's right up FEMA's alley. So I'd like to thank you very much. And I want to point out, you can't see the second clock. I end it precisely on time. Thank you very much. No, what we learned in that event based on what I was able to gather from TV news, which is not a good source of scientific information. <laughs>
On the other hand, I did observe that they probably need a little more training in their emergency management organization in Hawaii. And <clears throat> it's not that the person who pushed the button is a bad person. Right. Uh, they just weren't practiced enough in it. That's what I would conclude based on what I saw. Well, I can tell you this. I wouldn't do it now off the top of my head. I'd want to sit down and ponder it and think about it carefully. However, I can tell you this. If the next warning occurred within the next two or three years, I would mention the one that was a false alarm. And I'd explain to them, this isn't that. Because that's going to come up. And it's an obstacle for people. So let's get it out of the way. And I probably wouldn't hit the streets with the wireless emergency alert message unless it were also backed up by multiple warnings over multiple dissemination channels and the TV news stations interrupted coverage and were talking to the public. So I design warning delivery a little differently in Hawaii. And you know, we should have counseled Hawaii to consider doing that anyway, just based on all the public chit chat about all these nuclear bombs that could be flying back and forth and Hawaii's history with getting attacked in World War II, so on and so forth. So I, I, I think a little more broadly than just the message that went out, the official message. Well, first, I'd uh, educate emergency managers to uh, put everything out of their mind and all the myths that they may have succumbed to, like the public panics if you issue a warning, uh, or uh, emergency responders will turn yellow belly and not show up for work. These things aren't true. The cry wolf syndrome is also a myth. Now, if you issued multiple false alarms for the same population, let's say Hawaii, every other week for a month and a half, then you'd have a false alarm problem. But just because somebody went through one event, uh, they're probably going to be more vigilant and probably more likely to respond well to a subsequent event, uh, having gone through that false alarm, if the second warning takes that into account. So we can actually take advantage of false alarms. Of course, have we trained the warning providers with that knowledge? No. Uh, should we? Yes. Thanks for the question. Interesting because in the Oroville Dam, uh, one of the counties issued a mandatory evacuation order, and then the biggest city in the county, which represents about 75% of the population of the county, issued a uh, voluntary evacuation, which was a bit confusing for the people who heard them both. I, uh, I don't recommend that people distinguish between mandatory or a voluntary evacuation. I know law enforcement and emergency managers enjoy those distinctions, but it's really splitting hairs. Are you recommending that the public evacuate or not? And if you're not recommending that they evacuate, don't recommend it. And if you are recommending that they evacuate, recommend it. So I come down on the side of public safety. And that would mean if I were recommending an evacuation, I would make it mandatory. Let me just give you an example. I just saw quite off the record, but let me share it with you and whatever YouTube channels this is going over. The uh, mud flow inundation map for Santa Barbara. Those emergency managers are facing what I called the Godzilla monster. And it's like a PhD exam in emergency management. And you can see all the mud flow tubes and how all these other non-mudded parts of the community will turn into islands and people won't be able to get out for 7 to 14 days. And so they need to evacuate too. So would I recommend ever issuing a voluntary evacuation there? No. 
I'd recommend issuing a mandatory evacuation, and I'd hit them with every warning dissemination channel I've got. I'd call me up and say, write the message for us, and uh, it would be nonstop news, and the police cruisers would be going up and down uh, the whole thing. Uh, that's how I'd handle it. And then it may be that nothing happens. And then I'd get on the tube and say, wow, were we lucky. I'm so happy we erred on the side of caution, which, by the way, is what Sheriff Coney did in Butte County, who recommended immediate evacuation under the Oroville Dam. He's touted as a local hero. And I was in his office, and I said, my goodness, you're the scully of Butte County. He said, you know, the real scully just lives over there. He's got a ranch in Butte County. So that's what I would do, but that's the emergency manager's call, and of course that's why they get paid the big bucks for making those decisions. I have a comprehensive list, again thanks to DHS and FEMA, of hazards our nation faces. You wouldn't believe what some of them are. Uh, I've even uh, gone so far as to write warning messages for pending asteroid impacts. Uh, we have a, a global scientific society where people spend all their time looking for rocks in the sky, and there's a lot of them. Uh, most of the hazards uh, that are issued are for un that could be warned for are unfamiliar to most of the people who would get them. And even in communities that are used to, for example, earthquakes or floods, uh, uh, tornadoes, etc. Remember, there's always new people that are moving town for whom that's a brand new, unique event. Now, I think the principles of what constitutes good warning practice are pretty much trans-hazard, even terrorist hazards, biological hazards, technological hazards, natural hazards. How you communicate with people is pretty much the same. And the impact of experience or familiarity. I know it's a quick place to go to to think that makes warning easier. It doesn't. Uh, it makes it sometimes more challenging because people, the receiver is burdened by their last experience and the one they're facing may be totally different and you have to deal with that in the warning process. So I, I'm, I guess I'm not concerned about level of familiarity. That doesn't mean I don't support public education about hazards ahead of time. Uh, however, I'm, I'm not troubled by being able to warn people because of that factor. I'd be totally transparent and honest with the public. That's what they want. They can deal with the fact that we're human beings and we don't know everything. And so one way of handling that is, we can't predict how high the wave will be, but the best tsunami experts have counseled us to recommend to you that you act as if it will be a 30-foot high wave. Better safe than sorry. That's how I'd recommend handling it. 